Hey folks, if you've been following along in the last couple of weeks of Code Club here, you know that I've been doing a pretty deep dive into various aspects of calculating ecological distances using a Bray Curtis distance metric, or dissimilarity index, as the, the pedantics will correct me. Anyway, we've been looking at different approaches to calculating that distance. We've looked at not rarefying our data, rarefying our data, using relative abundance, normalization. Uh, and we've been looking at, you know, some of the critiques that people have made about rarefaction and kind of what, what are, you know, things that we might want to be worried about. And what I've personally found is that I've perhaps gotten a little bit hardened and that I, I still like rarefaction. And in fact, I maybe like it a little bit more um, because it's not so sensitive to the difference in the number of reads between the two samples you're comparing when you calculate the distance. Well, so far we've looked at one threshold, one uh, depth of sequencing coverage to calculate our distances. And one of the things that I've found is that when I rarefy to that threshold, um, the distances that I find on average between my samples is actually higher than the average distance uh, that I find when I normalize or when I use relative abundance data. As I've shown before, there are other problems with uh, relative abundance data and normalization that keep me from wanting to use that. But this question of the difference in the average distance has me thinking. So what I'd like to look at with you today is calculating the average Bray-Curtis distance as well as the standard deviation of those distances uh, for a bunch of pairwise comparisons of libraries that have different numbers of reads but where we will rarefy to different numbers of reads per library. Again, so far we've been looking at, I think about 1,328 sequences per sample. Well, what if we went up to 2,000, 4,000, 5,000, 10,000, and so forth, right? So as we increase that number, samples are gonna to start to fall out because um, you know samples just don't have that many reads. That's why we picked the threshold we did was because that was the size of the smallest library that we wanted to consider going forward. Heading over to our studio, let me reintroduce you to the code that we're working with. I'm in distances.r. If you want to get a copy of this script, down below in the description, there's a link to a blog post you can go to so that you can get everything I have, including the data and the code and just everything. I realize at this point, this distances.r script is a bit of a uh, dumpster fire. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff going on in here. Um, and so, um, work with me. Uh, this is real life, how I might do things, right? Where I'm kind of playing with the code and we call it spaghetti code because things kind of move in and out. Um, and, you know, when I'm starting to do this then for a publication, then I might take aspects of this out and pull things apart to make my code a lot cleaner and, and easier to read for people. But anyway, here we are. <laughs> We've got um, our libraries, Tidyverse, uh, give us all sorts of good stuff for manipulating data and making plots. Vegan allows us to calculate our distance matrices using rarefaction or not using rarefaction. SRS is the procedure that we use to normalize our code. And then we read in uh, the mouse data. So the data I'm working with is from a study we published years ago, uh, looking at the microbial community and how it changed over the first six months or so of the life of mice. Uh, and so this is getting a certain subset of the samples, uh, as well as those samples that have a desired number of sequences. Then what I did was that I randomized the data to make a null model. I basically took uh, my OTU table that we observed, and I then basically, you could think of it as moved all the individuals around. <laughs> but I did that in a way so that every sample still has the same number of sequences, and every OTU or every taxa has still been seen the same number of times across all those samples. Again, you can think of this as being 220 or whatever samples that were randomly drawn from the same statistical distribution, but with different sampling depths. And so what that means then is that when we calculate uh, two sets of distances between say four of our samples, those distances should be pretty close to each other. Um, and again, that's what I wanna look at is, do those distances shrink or get larger as the size of our smallest library goes up. Uh, let's go ahead and generate that data frame. And then I've got my rand group count data frame. And then here we have a chunk of code to generate our histogram of the number of counts. And so we can see we have some libraries that have as many as 30,000 um, sequences in them. If I wanna find the range of values in there, I could go ahead and do something like range on a rand group count, dollar sign n, and I see that my range goes from 1,828, I think I said 1,320, 1,828 up to 30,000, right? So that's about almost a 20-fold difference in the number of reads between our smallest library 
and our largest library. So I'm gonna come to the bottom of my script and we'll take RAND, which again is a tidy data frame. And I've done this in the last several episodes, so I'll, I'll just repeat it again. We're doing a lot of exercise with pivot longer and pivot wider in these I found. So we'll do pivot wider um, and we'll say names from equals RAND name and values from uh, N. And then I need to do values fill equals zero. And again, why I'm doing that is because this current configuration of my data frame uh, might be missing combinations of group and rand name. And so when it takes this tidy data frame and makes it wider, uh, those missing values, to make it rectangular, it's gonna plug in an NA value. And I don't want NA values, I wanna put in a zero because it didn't exist, it wasn't there, so it's zero. And so now, sure enough, I've got my group column um, and all my other columns. I then need to pipe this out as a data frame. And so we'll do as.data.frame, and I will call this randdf. And I think I actually have a randdf defined up above, but I'm sure that's annoying for me to refer to variables that you don't remember. So I'll, I'll make that here, that's cool. So then if we look at randdf, again, that shows all the columns, it's a really nasty output. Um, we have this group column that I need to get out and I actually need to use that and assign that to the row name. So the reason we're doing this as a data frame is because tibbles don't accept row names. And so we'll do row names randdf, and we'll say that then is randdf, uh, the first column. I could also put in group, but, but this serves the purpose. And then I can do randdf, and I'll say randdf uh, bracket minus one to remove that first column. And so now if I do rand df and pipe that uh, to str, and if I do row names on rand df, I now see all my sample names, they're good. So I've got rand df. In the past, I had been passing rand df into as matrix. Um, some of the folks that helped develop vegan piped up and told me I don't actually have to do that, that vegdist and avgdist should take it as a data frame. So we'll give that a shot. Um, but what we've done is say avg dist on rand diff df, uh, and then d method is bray, and bray is the default, but let's be explicit about it. And then we'll do sample equals, I think it was 1828, and we'll then assign this back, and I'll say rand dist matrix. Again, I have that defined up above, but we're, we're kind of making some messy code here. And if I do rand dist matrix, I pipe that to str, uh, I see that it is a distance matrix and everything looks good there. So I'd like to take rand dist matrix and make it a tibble so that we can look at the mean and the standard deviation. And so to do that, we'll go ahead and we'll make this a matrix. So we'll do as dot matrix because it's currently a distance matrix, right? Uh, so that outputs a matrix and then we'll go as tibble and we'll say row names equals samples. And so now we've got samples as um, the first column of our data frame, right? And so then we can then pivot longer, and we'll pivot longer uh, calls equals everything but the samples column. And so that looks good. And so now what we'll do is we will summarize uh, to get the mean and the standard deviation. So we'll do mean equals mean on value and then SD to be SD on value. And so we get a mean and a standard deviation. And so that I don't have to create a whole bunch of uh, different objects, I'm gonna include this in the pipeline. Uh, and instead of calling it randist matrix, uh, I'm gonna call it randist summary. And then if I look at randist summary, I see the same values. I guess the standard deviation is off to by just a smidge. Um, again, that's the product of a random number generator. Uh, let's go ahead and just experiment. Let's put this up to 5,000 and see what we get. Actually, I'm gonna go ahead and remove that randist summary because I don't totally need that. So we get a warning message that a whole bunch of samples were removed because they're below the sampling depth. Uh, and so then we get back a mean and a standard deviation. And sure enough, that mean is lower than what we had before. So I wonder if as we increase the sampling, we're gonna continue to see that happen. So. Um, I'm going to go ahead and add an end column here uh, so we can count the number of samples that we're seeing. And what I'd like to do is turn this into a function. I'll call this run rarify bray, and it'll be a function. And we'll throw in x as the size of the library that we want to use. And we'll have avg dist, 
and we'll make that the body. Um, and I think this should work actually. Um, it's going to take randf from being defined outside of the, the function. So if I go ahead and run all that, and then I call run rarefy bray, and let's do 2000. And I'm getting this n of 21609. That's the number of comparisons, not the number of samples. So I don't think I want that n. And I think instead what I will do is I will use the rand group count, and I will then filter that for n uh, greater than or equal to x. Uh, and I realize that I have 5,000 hard-coded in here, and that should be an x. Ah, why didn't you all say something? Anyway, um, so I'm going to make this my uh, mean SD as the output of that. And so this will be a tibble that has mean SD and my x. Um, I'm going to, for now, practice with it being 2,000. Let's run mean SD again. And, then, and so then that will give me mean SD being those two values. And then uh, for my filter, let's go ahead and make that n row. And so that'll be 225 samples. Um, and so I'm going to call this n. I'll do bind calls of uh, mean SD and n equals n. So I'll go ahead and run that and then bind it. And so now I get this tibble as output. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use one of the map functions to iterate over a bunch of thresholds. And so then each threshold will spit out this row. And so then I'll have a data frame um, with this mean and standard deviation. And that should be good. So I'm going to use the map function. I'll use map DFR. And we will go from, let's say, uh, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. And we will then iterate over the name of the function, run rarefy bray. So I need to go ahead and load my function and run my map function. Again, what the map function is doing here is it's taking that function, run rarefy bray, and applying it to values of 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 as that x parameter. It should then output the output, those three values, as separate rows uh, in a new data frame. All right, so we get our warning messages that we expect. Uh, our mean drops. Uh, but we don't have an indication of how many uh, sequences we're taking from each sample. So I can rectify that in my map DFR by doing ID equals n seeks. Um, and so let's run this. I'm sure it'll work fine. All right. So it outputted one, two, and three, which are basically the seats in the vector 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. That's not really what I want. I'm going to go ahead and remove that ID seeks and I'll add. Um, the number of sequences to my bind calls. So I'll do n seeks equals x. Yeah, that'll work. Um, okay, so I need to go ahead and reload my function and run this again. Hopefully it works. Again, I'm doing this with a small number of thresholds because if I was doing this for 20 or 30 thresholds, it would take much longer. Um, and I would be doing a lot of iterations of this and that would get really annoying. And my computer fan would just get louder and louder and louder. Anyway, so it's good to test at a small level, make sure things work, and then scale it up bigger and bigger as you go. All right, so that did exactly what I'd hoped it would do. Uh, we're looking good. All right, so again, I wanna do a lot of different thresholds. So let's replace this. Um, and again, looking at my histogram, I probably only wanna go up to about, I don't know, 15,000 uh, uh, sequences per sample. So let's do uh, seek, 1,000 to 15,000 by 1,000. So uh, by 1,000. So I could go ahead and run this. It's going to be 15 steps. Um, that's going to take longer than I really want to sit around waiting for. So what I could do instead is to use the fur package. So map DFR comes from the per P, <laughs> a bit of a cold. I don't know if you can hear that per package. Fur uh, allows you to use the future package with these map functions. And what the future package allows you to do is parallelize this. So if I've got 16 different levels and I've got 16 processors on my computer, then it should do it pretty quick, right? Because it's gonna run one threshold on each of the processors and then pull it back together. To do that, I need to do library fur. Uh, you need to make sure you have it installed. Uh, again, normally I would put library fur way back at the top of this script, but it's okay here for right now. Uh, as we'd kind of make the script a little bit more mature and clean, uh, that's when I would move things around and stop all the redundant code. And then I needed to say plan multi-session. 
what that does is that um, basically is telling R where to fire these jobs off, how many processors you have, and, and kind of getting things ready to do that. Um, I'm going to then call this um, rarefy bray results. Then we need to do future map dfr. There's an argument we can add to indicate the progress. So I can do period progress equals true. And so again, what this is doing is this is putting a single um, threshold on each processor. My laptop, I think, has 16 processors. And so I'm asking for um, 15 jobs. So I'll have one extra processor. If I look at my top output on my computer, I can see that I've got multiple cases of R running here. Um, and actually they're falling off one at a time um, because it's it's kind of working through each of those 15 different jobs. And so this is running a lot faster than if I had run them all in series. Uh, for some reason, this progress bar doesn't quite work. Um, I see there's 29 errors, um, warning messages rather. Uh, if I do warnings on those, I see that a lot of the warning messages are about uh, samples falling out because they didn't have, you know, say 5,000 sequences in them. There's also a warning message in here about unreliable value um, because there's a random number generator being used by AVGDist. Um, when I've looked things up on documentation for future map from the fur or future package, which it depends on, tells me not to worry about it. So I'm not going to worry about it. So let's go ahead and look at rarefy Bray results. And we see, sure enough, we have number of sequences, the mean, standard deviation, and the n, the, the number of samples in the study um, that had that many sequences. So let's go ahead and plot this and see what it looks like. So we'll go ahead and verify Bray results, ggplot, um, aes on the x-axis. I'm going to put n seeks on the y. I'll put the mean. Um, and let's go ahead and send that to geom line. And what we see is again, as the number of sequences being considered increases, the distance between sequences drops, right? And again, we can set zero as the bottom on our y-axis by doing chord Cartesian y lim uh, zero to na. And so we see it kind of does plateau or it's not such a dramatic um, fall off in those distances. Um, I would expect with like, you know, infinite sequencing that this would go down to zero. Um, because again, uh, there really is no underlying difference between my 225 or whatever it was, uh, different samples. Let's go ahead also and look at the standard deviation. And we saw this before in the last episode that we could go ahead and put these three columns into uh, the same column by doing pivot longer. So I'll do pivot longer uh, and we'll do calls of uh, mean, uh, SD and N. And that works, right? And so we can then pipe that into ggplot. On the x-axis, I want nseeks. The y-axis, I want value. Um, and then I'm going to do um, plus uh, facet wrap uh, tilde on name. And I want n row equals 3, scales equals uh, free y. Again, we can reorder this. Um, I might go ahead and do that uh, by using uh, the factor function. So we can mutate name to be a factor on the name function. And then we can set levels uh, to be, uh, let's put n first, and then the mean, and then the standard deviation. So what these data tell me is that I, of course, would prefer to have more sequences per sample. I mean, who wouldn't want that, right? Um, on some level, though, um, if I don't have as many sequences, what do I do with that, right? How do I how do I deal with that, right? And the way I always think about it is that if I have two samples that should have a distance of zero, but I'm getting 0.15 because I have, you know, shallow sequencing or just not as deep sequencing uh, as I might like, that that kind of tells you how big your effect size needs to be. How big do your two different treatments need to be to detect them as being statistically significant, right? So that's the way I think of it, right? So if I don't have a lot of sequences, then I need a larger effect size to see the differences. Again, there's lots to consider when you're picking that threshold for the number of sequences per sample. I generally don't think about this. I generally think about, you know, how do I get more samples in? Because that's also a factor that will affect your statistical power. The more samples you have, the easier it is to see a difference that's actually there. And so again, there's all these trade-offs between numbers of samples 
um, and the number of sequences per sample. That if you increase the number of sequences per sample, you're going to decrease the number of samples. So what do you do? Well, I have ideas, but we're running out of time for today. So stay tuned, because uh, in the next episode, I'm going to build upon this type of result to think about what effect does refraction or not refraction have on our propensity to make false positive results, to, to run a statistical test using something like Adonis and to accidentally, incorrectly, call a difference as being statistically significant when it's not. And how is that risk mediated by whether or not we rarefy, use the relative abundance, or normalize our data. Be sure that you've subscribed and you click that bell icon so you know when that episode drops. I can't wait to share that with you. It's gonna be pretty cool. Also, if you're trying to catch up and some of this is new to you, I encourage you to check out this video I have over here, which will help you get all caught up in what we're doing here in Code Club.